Well, our guest today has lived several lives, all of which are documented in his new book, Matt Memories, My Wild Life in Pro Wrestling, Country Music, and with the Mets. He is a former executive in baseball, country music, a pro wrestling journalist, and now adds author to the resume. A pleasure to welcome John Arezzi to Post Wrestling. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Doing great. little sad to say, uh first game was canceled because of COVID, but uh, other than that, I'm doing all right. Yes, this is the, the COVID world that we are uh, currently experiencing now a year in, and yes, uh, start opening day for Major League Baseball is, uh, is certainly up in the air for, for some teams, and it's funny because uh, given that we are based in Toronto, uh, I found this to be such an interesting intersection of you being roommates with two people that were pretty key architects for the Toronto Blue Jays organization of the past uh, 20 years in J.P. Ricciardi and John Gibbons that uh, you go uh, way back with these two individuals that this city is very well familiar with. Yeah, we're really, uh, really uh, close friends to this day, but uh, we were all kids back then in 1981. when We were all uh, with the Shelby Mets uh, baseball club. Uh, I was an executive for the team, and uh, John was the number one prospect uh, catching-wise for the team at the time. And JP uh, had a promising uh, early career, but uh, he turned that into a great career as an executive. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, two great guys to this day. I, I, I love both of them. As you were going into this project, uh, tell me a little bit about your thought process, because I mean, it's a very interesting, uh, I will say plural, careers that you have had, not just limited to professional wrestling. Uh, I found it to be really fascinating the way that you pretty much took the different paths uh, throughout your life. Was that at all uh, difficult just to present in a book that you had these very divergent paths? Uh, was that always the intention to kind of sh shed a lot of light? This is hardly just a pro wrestling book. Yeah, and that's what really compelled the... Uh co-writer greg oliver who obviously in the book world in the wrestling book world and even hockey books i mean is just such a revered and respected writer certainly uh but uh, that was uh that was the the thing that drew him in he didn't want to write another wrestling book when i was introduced to him through michael holmes at ecw press i mean but when i told him uh the story of some of the other things that i did that's what drew him in the music stuff the baseball stuff and uh, I'm so happy that it did because Greg was a great partner to work on this book. But, uh, you know, that that was my life. I mean, it's been a uh, crazy roller coaster, a lot of different things. Um, I've always been a little bit odd in the way that um, <laughs> I segue from this or that uh, career changing names. So I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know you know, how everything kind of segued into each other other than uh, I've never been afraid to blow the house up and start again. If uh, But I, but I always wanted to work in uh, professions uh, that I really had passion for and wrestling, baseball and country music uh, were always uh, passion, uh, passion things for me. I found that to be like a really uh, inspiring message throughout the book. And it was your constant, um, E evolution of just reinventing yourself and not having that belief that you would find yourself in one career path and just be led with what if instead you were more than more than willing to change your your life and it, it seemed like almost leave the the past in the past as you dove headfirst into your into your next career not looking back and that's something that I, I don't know if that's too common among people to be able to just make such significant pivots in their life. No, it's certainly not common. I mean, I've always been able to put things in the rearview mirror and I always, you know, I'm willing to close the the book on uh, a chapter in my life and then kind of start again and see where it goes. Uh, but uh, because I've had such a deep, rich history with wrestling, that was always easy to fall back on when um, uh, some of the other things that I was doing uh, ran their course. Uh, so it, it, it has been an interesting journey and an interesting ride. And it's not usual. It's not the usual path people take. I mean, most people, you know, find a good job and they get the benefits and they stay with companies for years and they have great careers. Me, it's like when things started getting a little, you know, uh, boring or I lose passion for something, 
I would jump around just as long as each and every day is an adventure for me. So a lot of our listeners will certainly be familiar with, with Pro Wrestling Spotlight and, and your work on that show, uh, which you continue now with uh, Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now that we'll, uh, we'll talk about as well. But uh, sure. in this book, um, you know, a lot of the connection to your show comes with that early 90s period. And this is at a time where I, I don't think the pro wrestling media has really, uh, th- this is like very significant coverage that you are providing to a lot of significant subjects from the Zahorian trial, the sex scandal of the early 90s. Take me back to, I, I would say like the early 90s and the the tone of the show. And was it always in in your mind, going with that that journalistic bent to the show or were these did these stories somewhat inform the tone of the show of how are we going to cover these because there would probably be a lot of outlets at the time that w- would not be covering wrestling to the the significance that you were at that point right when i started the commercial version of pro wrestling spotlight in 1989 i didn't know what the show would evolve into uh, you know, initially it was going to be an all kayfabe show. Uh, you know, I didn't really envision talking that much about the inside until I really got it started. And uh, when Ricky Steamboat left the NWA in 1989 and he agreed to do my show to talk about those contract negotiations, uh, that was really insider stuff. And that was kind of groundbreaking for the show. And then Jim Hurd came on the following week uh, to address steamboats claims and so i mean that got a lot of coverage with the sheets the the observer uh at the time uh wrote extensively about it and slowly but surely the show kind of evolved into this insider show even though there was always me walking on the tightrope with the uh, uh guests and performers that wanted to come on in kayfabe so i had to I had to go on both sides of the fence uh but it really took a turn uh for a real serious nature uh, beginning when uh, Billy Graham, superstar Billy Graham, came on my show to talk about what steroids did to him in 1990. And shortly thereafter, you know, before you know it, uh, Zaharian gets indicted by the federal government. Uh, there's the, all that s- the scandals uh, for the steroid um, part of it. And then it segued into the sex scandals. And I was knee deep in the middle of it, covering it uh, uh, with a journalistic slant and trying to really break stories and and just cover every aspect of that uh, era. Uh, And it was an era that almost destroyed pro wrestling, but I felt as a journalist at the time that I needed to cover it. Uh, And uh, I think I did, uh, I did my best uh, at that time and, 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 and covering all of these bad things that were happening in the business that I loved. What was the uh, relationship you had with, with your with, with your broadcasters at that point, was there ever any pressure on you of them saying, listen, this is, this is the circus. Just, uh, you know, get guests from the WWF, get these ticket giveaways. We don't want to cover wrestling in, in that kind of form. Or was it largely left to you to dictate the, the editorial and journalistic, uh, you know, principles of the show? Um, I mean, I was a, a person who brokered the time. So I purchased the airtime from those stations. So I was not an employee at any of the stations that I did Pro Wrestling Spotlight on. So I obviously had the right to dictate the content, Uh, not saying that I didn't get in some hot water occasionally Uh, during the scandals uh, part of it, especially the sex scandal stuff. I mean, WEVD that I was broadcasting on the time, a big powerhouse 50,000 watt station in New York City. Uh, there were letters that came in to station management from Jerry McDivitt, who was the attorney and is still to this day the attorney for the WWE. Uh, so, um, you know, but the station never took me off the air and uh, didn't see, you know, what I was reporting on was not libelous or slanderous in any way. Uh, I did have some censorship on the very second show I ever did. When our attorney, the attorneys for the station I was on at that time, WNYG, uh, I took an interview I did with Bruno San Martino that was scheduled for the second second episode of the show, and uh, he said a lot of disparaging things uh, about WWE and Vince McMahon or WWF at the time. That the station's attorney said that could 
potentially, uh, you know, lead to some uh, legal action. So uh, I called Bruno up and I retaped that interview to to cool it down a little bit. Uh, one of the names that come comes up, and I'm just curious uh, because you kind of outlined, you know, uh, interactions you, you had with the with the man, and it's just a, a name that exists. But I'm just curious uh, your dealings with one uh, Steve Planamenta, who is the head of uh, public relations for the WWF uh, during this scandalous period that I can't imagine what this guy's day to day was like. But just in terms of dealing with uh, WWE PR at that time, I mean. Uh, they're a unique company, to say the least, uh, th- throughout all of their time. But during this period, uh, tell us a bit about this individual who's uh, – you don't hear much more other than the name himself. Yeah, I mean, here's the ironic part with Steve. When I was in college, uh, one of my dearest friends who lived in Austin, New York, a gentleman by the name of Bill Martin, his neighbor was the Planamenta family. And uh, little Stevie, as we called them back then – was uh was a fan of mine read my uh newsstand magazine articles in the mid 70s and once he found out that uh bill martin his neighbor knew me and went to school with me i actually met him when he was a kid and signed wow. autographs for him or something and and lo and behold 1989 i'm starting pro wrestling spotlight and i call up the ww offices and uh it's steve planamenta the same kid who I had dealt with when he was just a young, young, young kid. And, uh, you know, he was, he was pleasantly surprised to hear from me, but he, uh, you know, told me that the WWF would cooperate as long as the show was not, and, you know, giving away inside secrets. And, and so he gave me Jimmy Hart for the very first show I ever did. And, and then the second show was that Bruno thing. And, and I told Steve, I interviewed Bruno and, and uh, he said, you're not going to play that interview, are you? And I was like, well, I think I have to. Uh, and then they stopped cooperating. But uh, my my um, my attempts to always bring on the WWF were always um, ignored. And I I had a blowout with Steve um, at a press conference after the Zaharian trial when McMahon announced steroid testing. And uh, they had this big press conference at the Plaza Hotel in New York City, and they failed to invite any wrestling media. And when I called to ask about it, because I found out that there was going to be this press conference, he literally said that there was no press conference. So he lied to me. And I got in. I snuck in. And um, under an assumed name, I used a different name and got on the the press um, list. And then I approached him with that. Uh, after McMahon left the dais and I went up to him and McMahon and I just said, why didn't you invite the wrestling media to this? And he goes, uh, he goes, well, we did. And, and, and no one, no one responded. And I told him <laughs> that was a lie. So, uh, and we had a tenuous relationship. I mean, it wasn't long after that when I was invited to the WWF offices with a couple of other journalists, Dave Meltzer, Wade Keller in 1991, where McMahon mm-hmm. had a meeting with us and tried to smooth things over and say that we needed to cover wrestling in a positive way and agreed to cooperate. And that didn't last long. So my relationship with Planamenta was, um, you know, was tenuous. And, and then even further than that, when I uh, was partnering with Vince Russo, uh, Vince started contacting the WWF uh, without me knowing it. And Planamenta was the guy that was orchestrating Vince's uh, access to a steroid imposium as long as I wasn't there and then introduced uh, Vince to Linda McMahon and Shane. And uh, so, I mean, Planamenta just uh, was a, a little bit of a, um, a thorn in my side uh, because you couldn't believe the guy, and uh, and he basically um, basically didn't cooperate. And so, you know, I, I you know I, I don't know what happened to him, where he is today, but uh, I have a, a bit of a history with him. Well, it's it's very interesting to hear like the the backstory just uh, of you know him as a kid being a, a fan of yours. Um, Something that was very uh, interesting to me re- reading about this was your, your coverage of the sex scandals and the fact that you had 
you had known Mel Phillips before his name becomes front and center in this, uh, in the entire uh, sex scandal of the early nineties. And I imagine, uh, you know, that's, it, it's a figure that you don't hear too much about people that actually knew the man, but you did. And it seemed that it was, you know, somebody that there were at least concerns about, but obviously could not have forecasted what, what would become of Mel Phillips. And it's a very dark period in pro wrestling history. And one that you, I mean, your, your coverage of that is, is certainly something people uh, tied to pro wrestling spotlight and your, your coverage of that story. Yeah, Mel, uh, I met him in 1974 at the Wrestling Fans International Association annual uh, meeting and awards banquet. And he was a fan of the year that year. Um, the same year I won Freddie Blassie Fan Club of the Year, um, when I ran the Freddie Blassie Fan Club, rather. And Mel and I got to know each other. And uh, there were always little hints that there was something amiss with this guy. And uh, so I was really careful because my intuition uh, was telling me to kind of shy away from him in some ways. Uh, and then when all this stuff happened and when Tom Cole came out and made the uh, allegations and Mel's name was attached to it, obviously, I mean, it was, um, it, it was something that, um, I had to cover. I mean, and I, and I, and I did my best to cover it, uh, fairly. And, but Mel's name kind of lives in infamy to this day. And, even though he's no longer with us, I believe he passed away in uh, 2012. Um, and he got quite a, quite a settlement from the WWF when he left. I mean, I wasn't even aware of it until recently where I heard he got $850,000 in severance. And that was for a guy that they claimed was a, an occasional laborer. Wow. He, um, in, in terms of just that entire uh, story, I'm kind of curious what these, Last few months have been where some of the key people, uh, Tom Cole and most recently, uh, Barry Orton have passed away. Has that, is that yeah. kind of, I'm sure that's forced you to have to go and kind of recount this, this story. And like you were, you were right in the middle of this in, in terms of that coverage. And it seems that a, a whole new generation are kind of learning about this story that's been, I mean, it's been out there, but you know, these recent, these recent passings have allowed, I think, people to go back and, and revisit this, this very ugly scandal of the early nineties. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, I, uh, ironically, when I got back into wrestling in, uh, late 2018 and started the podcast up with Brian last in 2019, and I had a presence on Facebook, Tom Cole friended me. And I had not talked to Tom since all of this went down in the early 90s. And uh, he basically said I was one of the only people that ever treated him with dignity and respect. Uh, and I know he listened to the podcast and he'd interact with me uh, on social media. And, and then in October of uh, 2020, um, I had been reached out to by some people who were thinking about doing and covering this in a television show. And then I reached out to Tom because they wanted me to make that introduction. And and then uh, Tom got back to me and said, I will talk to you and only you. And and then uh, I gave him my phone number and I was away from my phone when he called. Unfortunately, I was actually in the shower. And then I uh, after I got dressed, I saw I missed the call, tried to reach back out to him. But I never heard from Tom again, which was mm -hmm. really strange. And that was about the same time that Patterson had just passed away. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was kind of the end of it. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, hearing about, uh, you know, Barrio's uh, death and, um, you know, that was uh, another shocker recently. Uh, so yeah, it drummed up those old, um, you know, 30 years ago, but here we, you know, now you're revisiting all of this and, and it, and, and I covered it on the streaming show that I do, uh, but it was uh, sad. And, and, and when Tom, uh, took his own life, it was just, it was very sad. It hit me pretty hard because this poor guy was obviously something really bad happened to him years ago and it affected his entire life. And for him to take his own life, uh, he had to be tortured for all these years. But, you know, the ironic part is now all the alleged pepper, uh, perpetrators, alleged perpetrators and abusers are gone. Tom is gone. 
uh, and the only people that are still around are the ones in Connecticut who run the WWE. Uh, those are the only ones that really have the final answers to what all happened back then. Well, and it's uh, and it goes to just the importance of coverage such as yourself. It's it's not like there was widespread coverage at the time. It was it was the work of people no. like yourself, of Dave Meltzer, Wade Keller, Steve Beverly, and you know beyond that, it's. It's to me like that has kind of preserved like the knowledge of stories such as this that would not exist elsewhere. I don't think we had as rich of a uh, the depth of a, of the wrestling media. It was a very select few that were that were doing real journalism when it came to professional wrestling, as opposed to the ha ha kind of sideshow p- portrayal of what the industry was. Yeah, it was. Um... It certainly was that that way, but um, and even the steroid scandals were really not covered uh, that extensively by mainstream media. It really wasn't. It was it was because of its wrestling. Who cares? Uh, when the sex scandals uh, started, there was more of a media feeding frenzy, like you see today mm-hmm. uh, when things happen, and that lasted a few months, and then it, it uh, cul- culminated with the Donahue show. But uh, before too long, that was it. That was the story of the week, and they moved on to other things. If that, if those allegations broke today, it would be a whole different story. Completely everybody, different. Because the society's changed, the Me Too movement, all of that stuff. I mean, it would have been an explosive uh, national or international story if you had uh, – these sexual allegations against young underage kids, as well as performers who were saying they were uh, sexually harassed. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it was a, it's a different era today. But back then, it was a story that was uh, covered intensely for a month or so, uh, mostly by the Geraldos of the world. And there was some, you know, mainstream stuff like Donahue and CBS Evening News. Uh, but uh, for the most part, it was like, gone and then that was never talked about again really what comes to mind when you go back and and revisit that the the donahue appearance which is um it's pretty surreal to go back and watch now just to see this this collection of people all together on stage vince mcmahon included and uh, just Mm -hmm. even the stories that came out after the fact of Tom Cole is there in the audience, unbeknownst to to many people as well. But right. uh, this many years removed, what what comes to mind when you revisit that day? Well, I mean, that was a circus. I mean, it was surreal. Um, I had a chat with Dave Meltzer recently, and uh, we we were talking about it pretty extensively about how surreal it was. And uh, for me personally, I, I really didn't like the way I came across. I mean, I was wearing these dark glasses. I was not happy with myself. And then, you know, the story that I talked about, uh, one of the stories that I talked about on that show about, uh, the, uh, the midgets, um, you know, this would, these were stories that were told, uh, to Vince Russo for our newsletter. And then I brought, uh, Lord Littlebrook on my show to discuss these allegations. And then the Donahue show was that week and everybody thought it was kind of a circus and they laughed at it. You know, who knows what happened? Uh, you know, I don't know for sure what happened. These were just things that uh, were told to Vince Russo initially for our newsletter and then on my radio show. But I wasn't really happy with my uh, own um, interaction there, uh, with the exception of when Vince McMahon, um, I asked Vince if he, uh, when Hulk Hogan did the Arsenio Hall show, I asked Vince if he was devastated uh, you know, that I heard that he was devastated when he heard what Cog- Hogan said. And McMahon says, I never said I was devastated. And then Dave Meltzer said, yes, you did. You told me because that's where I heard it. And ironically, McMahon uh, thought it was a setup and it wasn't. I mean, he called Meltzer up and he was like, you and Arezzi set me up. And and uh, Dave was like, that was not set up at all. You know, and it wasn't. So, which yeah, which is which a- is somewhat ironic, John, given that I mean he it appeared had like the ultimate setup in place with like after the fact having like Tom Cole as almost like this right. checkmate I'm moment there. for for yeah. later on. Yeah, yeah, that was the thing. And talking to Dave and getting that memory re- refreshed about it. I mean, they brought Tom Cole in because it was supposed to be this big Perry Mason moment, and you know, here's Tom. If Tom's name was going to be brought up. Then McMahon was going to say, well, Mr. Cole is right here. 
and uh, uh, Cole was then going to call us all liars. Uh, so that didn't happen because once we found out, and this is also uh, refreshed information for me from speaking to Dave, uh, once McMahon found out, well, once we found out rather that Tom was in the audience, we were all told, don't even mention his name because there was, you know, the, there was going to be a setup on the other side. So it, it really to this day is a very historic day in pro wrestling and it's still obviously being talked about all these years later. Why, why do you think Vince McMahon did that show? I know he didn't want to do it. And he, uh, from what Dave is telling me now, like Dave sat right next to him and at every commercial break, Vince would say, this is the absolute worst day in my life, you know? Uh, but I think the heat was on. And I, and, uh, from what I understand from talking to Dave is that the reason McMahon agreed to do the show because he was hoping that, um, uh, he'd be able to introduce Tom Cole and Tom Cole would deny all of it. Uh, as as the show continues uh past this i mean you you covered like you know the there there's the whole uh steroid d- distribution trial that that occurs in 1994 and the run sh- the show runs until early 1995 and that's when Correct. you, you kind of take your your break at that point and i found it interesting not just the fact that you seem to leave pro wrestling in the rearview mirror uh, but the, to the point, as you mentioned, and it's as your build in the book is that you go by John Alexander. And was it almost like leaving that aspect of your life behind at that point that the new name represented a brand new start in a, a completely different field? Absolutely. That's the, the reason I did it. I mean, once I got burnt out from wrestling and the show went away in early uh, 95, but I stayed uh, I stayed in it as a promoter uh doing uh some shows i did a, a you know several shows with lucha with triple a um and i did a show with ecw and triple a in chicago in 95 and then i promoted some shows in 96 but it wasn't on the radio but i was losing money i wasn't happy with myself i was tired of getting worked by wrestlers i was tired of the guys like jake the snake i mean just kind of taking advantage and putting me through hell. And uh, one of the last shows I did was in Arizona at the Arizona State Fair, and I had Mil Moskris on top. And and just that, you know, guys were like he was – he ch- changed his plane ticket to first class and wanted me to reimburse him. And I wound up losing money that night, significant money. And I was like, I am done with this business. I just can't handle it anymore. I was going to be 40 years old. I had no benefits. I had no savings. I lost uh, even my car. I mean, I was just, I was down and out. I was like, I was looking for a way to see what would be the next chapter in my life. And and uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper for a account executive for a, a new country radio station on Long Island. And I applied for it. And, uh, you know, by the grace of God, I got that, uh, I got that job. And uh, when that happened, uh, I decided that I was going to, change my name uh and just kind of leave john arezzi in the rear view as you've said the rear view uh and that's what i did um so uh and i also at that time uh decided that uh, uh i had become too much of uh, i was i was becoming one of the workers in pro wrestling if you know what i'm saying i mean i wasn't happy with the way i did business and uh, so anyway, I, I just prayed to God and I was like, if you give me another chance, uh, I will always um, do what's right for anybody I do business with. I'll under promise, over deliver and I'll and I'll change the way I live my life day to day. And and when I made that promise to God or whoever is up there, um, my life changed and it got better every single year. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's the long answer to the question is I did decide to leave that name in the rear view and and uh it it significantly changed my life for the better. Did did that career in pro wrestling at all uh, assist you in 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 moving on the, of just some of the characters that you were around seeing like parallels in different industries that w- would help you or did you see this as a clean break that pro wrestling was almost this <clears throat> anomaly that you were caught up in 
Well, it gave me an education. Mm-hmm. It gave me a really good education. I mean, it really taught me how to how to be a good uh, how to do what's right in comparison to doing what's wrong. And, uh, and I, uh, and I had, uh, you know, an interesting life leading up to that point. So I had done a lot of things even at that point by the time I turned 40 and I just found it refreshing to be in a different environment and to work with, uh, you know, a, a cool radio station and, and get a new group of friends and associates and business, uh, people that I did business with and, and, uh, and it just kind of like, I, I just became a really happy person who went out of his way to do, uh, what was right by people and to super serve any client I had. And, uh, the friendships that I developed after leaving wrestling were, were different. They were, they were more normal in uh, every sense of the word, you know, and you didn't have to worry about who was working you and who wasn't working you. And what was your relationship like during these years with, with pro wrestling? Was it completely out of your life? You didn't follow it? That was a, that was a form um, of life? Not really. I mean, ironically, ironically, I still watch because when I got out, that's when the Monday Night Wars were just starting and wrestling really started heating up. And uh, I was enjoying the product. And, uh, and then, you know, Russo is working <laughs> with McMahon. So that, had, that piqued my curiosity. Uh, and wrestling stayed in my life in a smaller way, but a, a really funny story, which I think I put in the book is that, uh, when I was working at the radio station, uh, I had heard the WWF advertise on several Long Island stations and they weren't advertising on the station I worked with. So I reached out and I set a meeting up with a gentleman named Hugo Maslick, who handled all the Northeast advertising and media for the WWF. And we hit it off and uh, he started spending a lot of money uh, with uh, the station I was affiliated with. And, and uh, he was fascinated on how much I knew about wrestling and how much I loved wrestling. Although he didn't know I was John Arezzi. He was dealing with John Alexander uh, and he became a really good friend and a client. And, um, but I never told him I was John Arezzi. Yeah, I found that to be um, j- just so interesting, just the, the fact that that was, you know, an identity you did not want to attach yourself with. And no. right up into a really interesting story of a meeting that happens by chance with Dixie Carter and Jeff Jarrett as they're shopping around looking <laughs> for television before they get on Spike. And here they are getting a sit down with you, um, not realizing your <laughs> your heavy connection to the industry as they're, you know, shopping around Impact. Yeah, I mean, I was always kind of like very wary. Uh, I didn't want my new identity to to be found out. Um, I just didn't want to be associated with it, but I still loved wrestling in a lot of ways. And when Dixie approached um, uh, and requested a meeting at Great American Country Television, and I took the meeting because I have an open door policy, and and I was fascinated when she came in with Jeff Jarrett and. Uh, and once again, you know, I'm talking wrestling with them and how I'd love to have their show on our network. And and uh, they were just like, you're so passionate about wrestling. But I said, yeah, I've always loved it. Uh, but I couldn't get that show on the air because the people above me didn't want uh, didn't want it. Uh, they just signed a deal with the Grand Ole Opry and they just didn't want to put wrestling on the network. So but it developed a friendship with Dixie and it led to. Um, uh, her inviting me to local shows and I got to take my nephew Dominic to meet a, a, a T, uh, TNA stars. And, but I still kept the kayfabe of being John Alexander, not John Arezzi. And then, uh, that kind of, that kind of segued into when I randomly met her on an airplane and we were both heading to Universal Studios. I was cutting a TV commercial with a country artist and Bush's Beans and she was getting down there to do a pay per view and, Ran into her on the plane and she invited me to the show and they were shooting at the next lot over. And that was kind of really coincidental. And she invited me to the show and backstage. And at that point, it was like, all right, mm, all these years later, here we go. And uh, I showed up and ran into uh, some old uh, buddies like Cactus Jack and Jim Cornette and and uh, saw Russo for the first time in years. And uh, but I didn't still tell Dixie I was John Arezzi. It was, it was still John Alexander. And. And then Bubba Ray Dudley uh, sees me and he starts 
some heat with me and chokes me <laughs> <laughs> on TV. And, you know, it's just a crazy story, and, and it's all in the book, you know, and it was just a, such a bizarre time. Well, I I don't want to uh, keep you uh, too much longer here, but I did want to talk a bit about uh, Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now uh, that, as you mentioned, people can listen to yep. it at pwspod.com. And I would just like to ask that from the get-go of the show when you were starting it, was it always in your mind that any show I do, I better save it because who knows when this might be of value to me down the road? Because I think a lot of pro wrestling promoters would have uh, greatly benefited from that knowledge to save everything because you never know when uh, years down the road, people will want to revisit this stuff. Yeah, I never knew I was going to do a podcast. Uh, I mean, I really never thought I'd get back in wrestling at all, really. It wasn't until I was selling my home. And uh, I saw all these boxes marked wrestling and I did save everything, you know, from the eight millimeter films I shot as a fan at the garden to all the pictures I shot as a photographer and all the videotapes I kept as a promoter. And of course, all the vast amount of archives with pro wrestling spotlight. Uh, So at that time, I really was in a mindset of just trying to sell everything and give it a good home. And that was, that led me to WWE and their archives division. Uh, We had a few conversations, but nothing really transpired from that. And I'd gotten to know Brian last a little bit uh, based on um, uh, some interaction that he he invited me on to do the 605. And he, he was a listener of mine. And, and so we connected in some way. And then, you know, before you know it, you know, we're talking about starting a podcast to relive the history from back then. But yeah, I mean, do all promoters save everything? I don't think so. I think I was just kind of an anomaly where I not only saved all my wrestling archives, but anything I've ever done in my life has been documented really between the uh, home movies to the home videos to my days with Patty Loveless when she was a rock singer. I saved everything, videotapes, audio tapes, letters, uh, so um, it, it it could lead to a nice documentary someday. I'm sure that was music to Greg Oliver's ears when you told him, I've saved everything. Yes, it was great. <laughs> Just awesome. And, you know, he and he even came down to Nashville uh, when we were in the middle of uh, writing the book with Bob Kapoor, who works with him at Slam. And uh, he was, I, I know, you know both of them well, I, uh, both tremendous guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I gave them access to whatever they wanted and pictures and letters and this. And yeah, so yeah, it was great for Greg as uh, as meticulous as he is in research and uh, and uh, his writing and his uh, the way he just conducts his business. I mean, uh, I gave him a lot of uh, ammunition and, and uh, documentation on everything that I talked about. And he even uh, got to uh, meet and interview uh, one of the artists that I managed, Sarah Darling, because he felt it was important to speak to the artist that I uh, managed back in the day. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, getting back to the original question. Yeah, I saved freaking everything. And a lot of people don't do that. And I'm happy I happy I did. Well, for me, uh, I had always known the name John Arezzi. But when you made your your debut on Twitter and some of the archival footage you were posting i was just i was enamored with like the the photos that you had and just i mean clearly uh evidence of all that you had saved and that uh, originally just uh drew me to wow this was you know th- this figure that had just uh you know popped back into the the wrestling world all of a sudden yeah i could actually um give credit to two people about my return and one is my nephew dominic uh who is uh a wrestling fan and he is the one that uh, that really sent me the link to the podcast that Vince Russo did uh, when he was uh, hosting the show called Truth with Consequences. And he was saying some disparaging things about me and my nephew sent it to me. And and before you know it, I'm reaching out because I was like, I need to answer this guy after all these years. And uh, at the same time, I started a Twitter account just out of curiosity and uh, just to see and people remembered me like yourself and others and i started posting archives and and then i did that one-on-one with vince that was uh, on youtube and we kind of talked it out and so in a way i mean me getting back in uh was my nephew dominic making that introduction 
But the same way that I brought Vince Russo in, it's almost kind of ironic that he is uh, to a to a uh, uh, a pretty strong part of me getting back in. There you go. It's uh, you know, you brought him in, and I guess in turn he brought you back in. Yeah, and we're not enemies anymore, so that's good too. Well, John, uh, I want to encourage all of our listeners to go check out Matt Memories, My Wildlife in Pro Wrestling, Country Music, and with the Mets. And it's available uh, this Tuesday through ECW Press. Uh, it's available on Amazon, wherever books are sold. Uh, you can check out the podcast at pwspod.com. And we'll we'll end off with this one. How how are the Mets looking this year, John? How, what, what are we forecasting? Well, I mean, I'm very optimistic. Um, I think the Mets are going to do great. They just uh, locked Lindor in for 10 years, and they got a very core group of very talented guys. And I think with the new ownership, that for the first time, um, Mets fans can sit back and say, we're going to have a competitive team, and we're going to have ownership that's going to do anything to uh, uh, get us to win. So I am really, really optimistic about where the Mets go from this day forward, uh, leading to many years to come of uh, competitive baseball. So I'm optimistic that they're going to be in the hunt when the season ends. Well, John, thank you so much for this time. Uh, you've spent a lot of time chatting with us. It was really great to speak with you for the first time and uh, just go go into all of this. I, I found it really fascinating reading the book and then uh, getting the opportunity to speak with you about it. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. I really appreciate you asking me to do it.